All right, thanks, John. Got it. client asked me the other day, she says, why don't you take your acronyms list and, uh, and put the website link for each one? <laughs> like, what do you think? I got time just to sit around and do something like that all day. <laughs> 5,000 acronyms on this list, you know? <laughs> Good Lord, man. All right, looks like um, we still got a few more people joining, but we can go ahead and get started. Does anybody got a bid solicitation proposal they want to work on today? Somebody got a question about a bid solicitation or proposal? Are you guys going to make it easy on me because it's a Friday? Is that what's going on here? Anyone? Bueller? Well, this will be a first in five years if no one has a question or nothing to work on. I don't know if they can hear me. Can you guys hear me okay? I got someone said I wished I did. What's going on? Yeah, see if you can log in. Cause um, yes. Marty here. Hey, um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I guess you would say, building a, a pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going through and looking at opportunities and developing an Excel spread document, a spreadsheet document for my pre-solicitations. And, and I've got some solicitations getting ready to come up that I will actually be putting together some proposals for. But the... Uh, so I built this, you know, pipeline of 39, 40 different opportunities that I'll be tracking as they move from pre-solicitation phase to solicitation phase. I provided the, the organizations, the agencies, um, my capabilities document, uh, and an introduction, and some of the other uh, agencies I've worked with, uh, and uh, it's just, and I'm just waiting now for these solicitations to, uh, the pre-solicitations to move to a solicitation phase um, as it relates to, you know, acquisition logistics and, and professional services, facility engineering. But the bottom line is uh, those are not micro uh, purchases or micro uh, acquisitions, simplified acquisitions. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at some other areas for that, but I really haven't seen anything at the micro level. Micro purchases used to be 3000 and under. So, for example, uh, agency wants to buy food for uh, a meeting. They could go to a grocery store with a P card, and as long as they spent less than $3,000, they could make a purchase with the P card, and that grocery store would not have to be registered as a federal vendor. They could buy from anyone. Um, that The rule still applies that that's the case, but because the government is pushing 23% small business set-asides, we're getting more and more people that are calling in saying, they're telling us we have to register now. We've never registered. I've been selling to the government for 20 years. 
Now they're telling me I got to register. Only reason why they're doing that is because they want to be able to show that they spent that money with a small business. So a lot of things are changing. Uh, even micro purchases now are being put out in FBO. I see opportunities in FBO for contracts under 3000 and they've changed the threshold a few times. They modified it. So you're going to find some stuff in FBO that's a micro purchase, but you're going to get more of that kind of thing, like you said, by building your pipeline, by getting in front of these guys and letting them know you're compliant. And so, you know, I, I'm corresponding and I, I'm getting some feedback, um, but uh, I think because of, of what I'm trying to accomplish, uh, it's not the uh, simplified acquisitions that you would find uh, if you were targeting industrial supplies or office supplies or medical supplies or specific equipment and hardware. I'm more into the services a professional services side. So do you think I'm headed down the right path? Uh, and it's just going to take a little bit of time. Just, you know, next week I'll start actually doing solicitations, working on it this weekend. Yeah, you're fine. You're, 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 you're on the right path. You're doing good. Um, just keep chipping away. It's all you can do. When you, when you reach out to these guys, when you make the phone calls and you call purchasing officers, you're going to get, it's going to be about half and half, maybe, maybe a little more one side than the other. Uh, half these guys are going to tell you wasting your time that you can't call them and they're just going to give you a contract. It doesn't work that way. And they're right. That. A lot of those guys, they put stuff out for bid and that's the only way they buy, uh, through the federal government is by putting it out to bid to the FBO and, and, um, et cetera. But if you make enough of those calls, you're going to find people that also have the ability to hire without putting it out for bid and do simplified acquisitions and make emergency purchases and sole source and single source, stuff like that, especially if they work for FEMA. Um, and mm -hmm. I can tell you this, it can get a little frustrating calling and, and having people tell you that you're wasting your time. But if you stick with it, I guarantee you it'll work in the long run. You'll get something out of it. I had a, a construction company months ago got in on the training one day and they're like, well, you know, we're going to call BS on that one, John Wayne, because we've been calling people for two weeks. We've gotten nowhere. These guys are telling us we're wasting our time and we're spinning our wheels. And I said, uh, you know, to some extent you are. Some of these guys aren't going to buy from you that way. So you are wasting some time, but you have to, you know, you have to invest. You have to take some no's to get some yeses. And I said, I promise you guys, if you stick with it, you're going to get some business out of this. And a couple of days later, I got a phone call from him saying, uh, you were right. We, we stuck with it, and we got a couple of good phone calls. We already went out and met with one guy, and we got a deal, signed the papers today. We got another meeting tomorrow. We got a couple more follow-up calls. So I'm glad we stuck with it because you're right. It did pay off in the long run. I wouldn't tell you to do it unless I knew it worked. I don't give people busy work, you know. Just wanted to give you a little conversation piece since everybody is being quiet. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I've uh, I bought into services and products in the past, and they weren't that good. And in order to keep you from realizing they weren't that good, they gave you a bunch of busy work. And, uh, you know, you stay so busy with the busy work that you don't realize you're just wasting your time. I don't do that. I only tell you guys to do things at work. Um, you know, that's just that's just who I am. And hey, John, just a quick question. Um, are you going to send out that list of all the uh, contracting officers? Um, which list? Uh, did you say you had like a spreadsheet or something like that that we could call up? <laughs> when, uh, when people sign up for the SAP program, the case manager runs a report, and they'll send you a list of a couple hundred purchasing officers and a couple hundred private uh, uh, vendors that you can call. But what I do is I teach you how to search and, and pull that information yourself. It's what we call mining, mining data. Uh, I'll teach you how to do that. And then if you guys want my master list, my gold mine, you got to uh, email me your Skype account because, dude, it's, it's 70,000 people. It's a huge Excel spreadsheet. I can't email it. I can't nothing. It has to go through Skype. And every time I try and send it through Dropbox, for some reason I have problems. So set up a Skype account, email me, and I'll, email, I'll Skype it to you. It is an old list, so it's not, you know, it's not 100% accurate. But it's got names, addresses, phone numbers, and emails. All right. Hey, John. Yes. 
I had a question for you. This is Trent from GTI. I talked yes. to Marianne, and she mentioned that um, you and you was uh, working on a, um, a, a an example of a bid, but you were currently going through one and and lining out the important stuff. Is that still something that that's going to be available at a later date? An uh, example of a of a bid. I did one a while ago. But I had to go through and delete all the private information out of it. I had to delete all the information about the contractor. I had to delete all the information about the purchasing officer. And I wound up with a document that was full of a bunch of holes. <laughs> it hardly even made any There was nothing in the end. There was nothing left in the end, really. It, it was Swiss cheese. Okay. Um, so I kind of figured that's what you were going to say. You know, and I run the risk that if I missed something, if I missed okay. a, a piece of data and uh, – and now that's floating around on the internet, and the purchasing officer realizes I got his data floating. I could get in huge trouble. So I just, you know, just a sec. okay, okay. I it was ready. just a. It was on my. It was on my to do list to ask you. Yeah, it, it sounds like it would make sense to be able to see a sample. But the one I did the sample on was the one that when you guys hear me tell the story about a client that would have won the contract for the nuclear power plant, but the proposal uh -huh. writer they hired uh, forgot to attach the. Um, forgot to attach the bid bond that's the actual one that I did because when we did the debriefing the purchasing officer told us that we were the first choice he would have hired us uh, but we made a very basic amateur mistake and forgot to include the bid bond and they paid him I think wow. they paid him nine grand to write that and he forgot to attach the bid bond and they lost it wow and I'm assuming there was no refund or partial refund or anything nope nope no, no proposal writers give guarantees except me. I'm the only proposal writer I know of that will give you a guarantee. And what, what, what type of guarantee do you provide, if you don't mind me asking? Well, the government. The only thing the government guarantees is death and taxes, right? Uh huh. <laughs> I guarantee this. Um, I can't guarantee you're going to win it. Nobody can. But I guarantee uh -huh. you, if you don't win it because it was my fault, because I made a mistake. I'm going to keep writing for you until you win one. That's just me. For free? Yeah. I couldn't do that okay. to a person and sleep at night. If I wrote a proposal, if I wrote that proposal and forgot to attach the bid bond, and then the government said uh -huh. you could have won it, but you made a mistake and didn't attach the bid bond, and, uh, and, uh, and okay. I charged you know, eight, nine grand for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. That's just not right. You know? Okay. But, That's uh, commendable. No, I mean, Thank if it's you. my fault, I'm going to make it up. Uh -huh. If you lose the okay. bid because your pricing was wrong or you okay. gave me data that was wrong and it wasn't my fault, I'm still going to help you. I want you guys to win contracts. The more contracts you win, the more successful I am. <coughs> okay. You know? Do you offer any pricing um, services or um, – like I know that there are pricing cons – like consultants out there in the world, but is there something offered through to John Wayne service for pricing? You there, John? For proposal writing? Yeah, yeah. Like like when it's time to to um, like once we receive the subcontractor's um, uh, estimate, are you able to provide a service? Where the the primary can tack on um, their their profit and what's and what's needed to to actually manage the contract. Oh, if you want me to write a proposal for you, you got to give me the solicitation number and the estimated value, okay. and then I can give you a quote as far as what it would cost for me to write it for you. But even when I write uh, bids and proposals for my clients, it still requires a lot of work on your behalf. It's not like you're just going to hand me a check and say, do it, and I'm going to hand you a finished product. Okay. No, no, no. no. My, um, my question is, do you offer a service that will help when, you, when we're trying to come up with how much to make off the deal, or is that… Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm here every day from 4 to 5, so anything you ever want to discuss… Okay. We can discuss in the group session, or you can drop me an email. Um, the, the reason why I do these group trainings is to actually work on bids and proposals to teach you guys how to do it. I'd rather teach you okay. than have you pay me to write them for you. 
Um, when, okay. when people do pay me to write a proposal, in the process of writing it, I teach them how to do it because I don't want to write proposals. Um, I, I want to help people win contracts. I want to teach a man to fish. You know, you give a man a fish, feed him mm -hmm. for a day, teach a man a fish, you feed him for life. He'll, he'll stay drunk on a boat, but at least he's, feed, he's, he's eating, you know. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, John. <laughs> I want to teach you guys to fish, but if you need me to write a proposal, send me the solicitation number, give me a guesstimate as far as the total value, um, and I can give you a quote on writing it for you or, and teaching you in the process as well. Or you just join my trainings and I'll teach you for free, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Any, John. No problem. Any other questions? Anybody got a bid, solicitation, proposal to work on today? John. John. Yes. Um, I wonder if you can find one of those veteran, disabled veteran uh, contracts. See if we can pull up something on uh, something that we can submit a bid on. Pull up a service disabled veteran contract to bid on. Sorry. You said pull up a service disabled veteran contract to bid on. Yes, um, as either on Fed bid or on Fed up. Almost everything, and more than half the contracts in FBO are set aside for veterans and service disabled veterans. Because there's so few service disabled veterans and veterans that are registered. Um, yeah. you know, if you go in and you put in just a basic keyword. Keywords, uh, maybe um, fill, fill kit or touch light. I've seen a few of those. So if you just do a basic search, you'll see that um, that one's a small business, that one's a small business, small business, small business, small business, small business, woman-owned small business. Usually more than half of them are veteran as well. Let's it's go so by department. Let's What's do a search by department and go to um, veteran listing. I mean, you can do the advanced search. Yeah. And, and you then, can better owned. That's right there, yes. And then let's put uh, said fill kit. Um uh, fill like military kit or bags or <coughs> nothing. Okay. Let's go to let's do all and see. And then we can just pick up one. Now I you realize, I thought, even when yes. it's not set aside for veteran-owned, uh, that's still beneficial that they hire you, even though it's not set aside. Okay. All right. So imagine an agency has to spend their money on their on their set aside. So, for example. I mean, before I get into this, does anybody have a bid they need to work on today that's due today or tomorrow, anything like that? Let's do that first. If not, no. Well, we can have a private session later. That's one. Okay, so agencies have to meet their set-aside criteria. They're supposed to award 23% of their budget to small businesses. They're supposed to award 5% to minorities, 5 to women, 5 to veterans, 3 to service stable veterans, 5 to 8A, and 3 to hub zones. Um, if they, uh, even if they just put something out for a small business, they're going to say uh, minorities, women, veteran, 8A, and hub zone are preferred. So the more uh, set aside you have, the more sought after you are, the more preferred you are. So even though the contract's not set aside, for a service disabled veteran, it would benefit that agency to hire you because you're a service disabled veteran. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So if you're searching um, FBO only for veteran-owned contracts, you're, you're hurting yourself because there's contracts that are not set aside for veterans that you can still bid on that you would still get preference on. Okay. But I know I saw a, a lot of them in the, in the Department of uh, uh, Veteran Affairs. And they were mainly veterans disabled set aside. Well, if you set your searches up in FBO by keyword, they'll run automatically. So you just have to look at your email each day and read the email to see if it's a good opportunity. Go to opportunities, and that's how I saw it. If you go to agencies. If you, you want to search, uh, what are you trying to accomplish? You're losing me here. Why are you being so specific? I don't, I don't understand. If you're because too specific, you're, even though it's not that aside for veterans, I see that some of them are uh, for veterans, and the veteran knows some of those products, and they know exactly what they are. Well, you can do an advanced search and, and only go by, you know, the VA. Okay, that's fine. But then you're, you're missing out on all these other opportunities. All these other agencies are hiring veterans. Okay, I see. You know, if you're too specific, you're going to get very little opportunities. And if you're too vague, you're going to get a lot of garbage. So there's a fine line in between, you know, there's a balance. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any okay, other questions? I say veteran owned small business. Yeah, I checked off the veteran owned box, so that's the only thing that's going to show up in here. So if it's if it's veteran uh, veteran woman owned, you're not going to get it because you're only looking for veteran. Okay, I see. Any other questions? Anybody else got a question or a bid, solicitation, proposal to work on? Yeah, John, this is Darren. Um, I had a question, kind of what, a little bit what we were talking about yesterday with as far as coming up with the funding to go for fill a contract. Sometimes you got to get materials or uh, products or whatever to fulfill that contract, so you got to put money up front to go get those. Um, would, it, would it be, uh, or is it a common practice to ask the contracting officer for uh, like a prepayment, like a, if there's any options for a advanced payment, if we give them a discount or something like that, or is it pretty much whatever the contract says is how they do it? No, the only way you're going to get a discount or, or, or get prepayment uh, is if it's a simplified acquisition, they tend to prepay on those automatically. Um, if, uh, okay. If you offer them a discount on the uh, discount terms page of a standard form, they'll pay you quicker. Uh huh. So, for example, you got to deliver them. You got to fulfill the contract first, uh, regardless. Correct. Yep, yep. You got to fill the contract first, and then uh, invoice them. If you give them a discount on the uh, uh, invoicing, um, you know, net five minus. 1%, you're going to give them a 1% discount if they pay you within five days of invoicing. But you still have to fulfill the contract, and they have to receive it and then be invoiced before they're going to pay you. So the only way around that okay. is to ask them if it's possible to get a prepayment or a deposit. Worst they're going to say is no. And okay. if that's the case, then you'd have to finance it. Right. Now, the beauty of most suppliers... Uh, and this happens all the time, 
when you do when you do a deal with someone, let's say you broker it or you you uh, sell a product that belongs to a certain manufacturer or supplier, and you buy it from them and you ship it, and the government pays you and everything's everything's good, that supplier ninety nine percent of the time will give you terms from then on out. Once you once you do one deal with them and you come through and they get paid and everything's happy, they're going to go out of their way to give you terms to keep it coming back. And once you get net thirty or net sixty yeah. terms, then you'll you'll never be out of pocket on that kind of thing. Yeah, then you're all set. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Anybody got a bid, solicitation, proposal to work on today? Hey John, this is Jason from GCI. Yes. Hey, got a question for you, and this is a SAMS related question. Um, you know, we all our information has been submitted, and we spoke with the federal desk or whatever it was, because we're still waiting on our cage code to be released to us. Right. <laughs> Can we can we still submit a proposal? They told us that we're still within that. I think they said it takes 11 days in order to get it back. Can we still submit bids even though we haven't received our cage code yet? Most your uh, you know most bids require you to put your cage code on the standard form, or they're going to want to see it on your um, on your uh, cap statement stuff like that. So you can put pending where it says uh, cage code. You can just put pending. And sometimes they'll accept that, sometimes they won't. Hey, John, that's actually what I did. This is Darren. The contract I just won a couple of days ago, Yeah. Uh, we actually didn't have a cage code when I submitted the bid. Um, I just That's exactly what I did. I just said pending. Put pending on it. In the section it. where it asked for the cage code, and then nice. I still want it. Nice. Yeah. And then I provided the cage code. When they actually sent me the contract, uh, they did ask for the cage code at that time, and then by that time I already had it. I told me you had so it, it wasn't yeah. a problem. I tell people all the time, they say, you know what, I, I want to do this, but I don't want to start until I'm fully compliant in all the systems, which I understand, but uh, most bids aren't due for two to three weeks down the road. So if that's the case, yeah, you'll be fine. Okay, and my last, my last question is, we are, we're possibly looking at a subcontractual relationship with somebody. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about getting them? They're not registered within SAMS. Um, how would we go about getting them registered and all that info? Would it be the same way that we did with you, with your organization when we signed up for your services? Yeah, I mean, you could just refer them to me, and I'll take care of them. Uh, the, the, here's the thing, though. And I'll never tell you what you want to hear. I'm always going to tell you what you need to hear. Uh, yes. I, I'm not saying that, you know, sure, I'll take on another client, no problem, but... Uh, it's, it's not about me, it's about you and giving you guys the right advice and, and the best advice. Uh, teaming agreements are a double-edged sword. They can be wonderful and they can be very dangerous. They can be painful um, because you're literally agreeing to be, res to be half responsible with another person or another business. Um, if you're going to do a teaming agreement, you really need to get an attorney involved and have them write up the teaming agreement paperwork or have them review the teaming agreement paperwork from the company that's wanting you to team with them. Um, okay. Because, and if you need an attorney that specializes in that, let me know, I've got one. Um, okay. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen people do a teaming agreement and, uh, and get screwed, literally, um, because they didn't review the agreement uh, or they didn't uh, have an attorney review it. And now they got a, a two-year non-compete against this company. They can't do any government contracts now for two years. You know, you're better off <clears throat> if it's at all possible. You're better off taking on the contract as a prime and subbing that portion out as a subcontractor. But okay, because that then you're covered, then you're safe. They can't do anything to hurt you except do a bad job, which they're not going to do because then they won't get paid. 
Okay, even even if the contract is not necessarily within our specialty, but it's more in the specialty of the subcontract, the subcontractor, you still suggest we take it on as a prime? I would. I mean, I wouldn't do teaming agreements, me personally, because I've just seen too many people get screwed on it. So I would just take it on as a prime and sub it out. Unless it's a brick and mortar and you have to do a certain percentage of the work in-house, you could sub an entire contract out 100%. Gotcha. All right, thanks, John. Yep. John, does it make any difference on oh, okay. what phone system the person is using? Does it have to be a wired line, or you can use VoIP line? Um, what's the question again? Okay, uh, does it make any difference as the phone is set up? Because sometimes they search the company, and they want to be able to call and find out if the company exists when they're doing due diligence. Does it make any difference whether it's on a VOIP line or just a regular uh, phone line? I've never had a, I've never heard a purchasing agent say, um, you know, I didn't choose them because they were using a cell phone or a voice over IP and they didn't have a landline. Um, I have had, I did have a purchasing agent say they almost didn't award a contract to one of my clients because my client was using a Cricket Wireless and when you call it, it says the Cricket Wireless client you were calling is on the other line. Please leave it there. Cricket Wireless, that, that's for retired people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so to some extent, it could. All right. And, and here's the thing. You want to make sure purchasing agents have no reason to say no. Okay. Part of the problem of getting awarded a contract is the purchasing agent's perception of whether or not you're going to provide uh, proper services, and I shouldn't say so many words with P's because that's um, in a row. The, uh, you know, their perception of you is part of the is is part of the uh, the the choosing process. You know, if they think that you're not going to do a good job, they're less apt to hire you. So anything that's going to give them a bad impression, that's why when I tell you to talk to purchasing agents, always say I and we and us. Um, instead of saying me and I, like it sounds like you're a one-man show, even if you are a one-man show, you don't want them to think that because that yeah. makes them perceive that you're less trustworthy. You're going to do less of a job than a, a larger corporation with a lot of employees would do. So that's, perception is part of the battle, you know, but I don't know how they would know that you're using a wireless uh, cell phone versus a landline. I, I don't know if they'd be able to tell that. Okay. All right. That's good because so. Uh was one of my clients that brought it up, but she's on an old school. Yeah, if they're using a Cricket Wireless or something like that, I'd tell them to get a real cell phone. Okay, I get it. <clears throat> That's like people that are using, uh, instead of using their web email on their domain, uh, or maybe they don't have a domain, they don't have a website, so they're using an AOL account. AOL's old school, and some people look at AOL and they think, does this guy even know how to turn a computer on? You know, um, so definitely, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if it's not going to cost very much to correct it, go ahead and correct it. Okay. All right. Hey, John. Yes. Um, it's Trent from GCI. I just had just another one more question about teaming agreements okay um so i just to, i want to make sure I, I understand if if we let's say are looking at let's say uh a, a, a neurology uh solicitation and it requires 90 percent of the work to be done by the neurology agency that that we have an agreement with yes will a will a purchasing agent look at GCI and say you guys don't know jack about neurology so you we don't want you to be the prime on this you need to be the sub can that happen no I don't, I've never seen that since I've been here I mean I see uh, I've seen some strange things okay but but for the most okay. part okay you, you got to look at it this way. Federal purchasing agents are supposed to spend 23% of their budget with small businesses. There's very few small businesses that are compliant, so they really get more than two or three offers. 
and you're talking to someone who, you know, humans in general are lazy. They're only going to do as much work as they have to. They're not going to go above and beyond and do things that they're not required to. Uh, therefore, they, you know, they want to do their job as easy as possible. Um, so a lot of them are not going to put a whole lot of weight on anything except you know, who, who followed the instructions and has a de decent price. And if it's a small business set aside, okay. it's never about price on small business set asides. It's about the technical uh, proposal. So if you have the right solution, you don't have to have any experience or have to have the best price because you have the right solution. I got you. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Yep. Thank you. Yep. If there's no other questions, I want to show you guys something uh, I just learned today. I have one. Qu I have actually two quick questions. I just got on the meeting, John. This is Stephen. Okay. Um, uh, I got a uh, deal back from FedBid. Uh, FedBid that said um, the bid was too high. Is am I was I the only one bidding on that? And they did they send that back to me? Sounds like it because uh, usually on FedBid and FedConnect, if your bid's too high, they tell you it's denied. You just said it's too high, and and they extended it out another five days. I guess they want me to rebid on it. They want you to sharpen your pencil, yeah. And you can, when you set up a bid in FedBid, you can set it up to automatically drop price in increments of a certain dollar amount until it reaches the absolute lowest point you're willing to go, and then it it uh, takes you out of the process. Sure, sure, okay. The other thing is, is that uh, you know, I went to this uh, conference uh, in D.C. Uh, day before yesterday and um, made a lot of contacts, got a lot of cards, got uh, a lot of emails, and um, explain to me exactly how that works as far as like some of these companies like Boeing and and. Uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, would I be a sub subcontractor to one, to one of their contracts, or how does that work exactly? Well, you can do all of the above, which is, I suggest, um, primes, any prime that gets a contract over 650000 has to hire 23% small businesses in order to maintain that contract, most of the contracts, not all of them, um, in which case primes are almost always looking to buy from small businesses. Uh, that's, why right. they have a, that's why they have a small business liaison officer. If it wasn't for that rule, they wouldn't hire small businesses at all. It's a pain in the butt, and it's risky. But they actually have a division uh, and a small business liaison officer who's in charge of that division to make sure that they meet that 23% criteria. I got a lot of people that uh, I got. That it's that's exactly what it says on their on their card. Is that's that's they told me to email them and send them everything and. Yep. Um, I mean, I was really shocked. I wasn't shocked, but I was just I was welcomed, and I and I felt welcome there. You know what I'm saying? It was, and it was it was a it was a it was a good experience. Some of, I had one one guy that was cocky, and he was kind of an a hole. But other than that, it was a good experience. Yeah, and that's why I tell people the importance of getting your set asides and also getting the state set asides, the DBE, the MBE, um, the WBE, because. Those are things that just like the federal government, the state governments require people to hire a certain percentage of MBEs and DBEs as well. So you can get uh, work from primes that do state contracts just because you hold those certifications. Some of you guys might have heard of the term what's called a pass-through. A pass-through means a prime would hire you and pay you just to show that they paid you and not even have you do the work. It's, it's illegal in some states. It's frowned upon in most states because you're, if they're going to pay you, you're supposed to do the work. But it's really not you that can get in trouble for it. It's more the prime that can get in trouble for it, and it's extremely hard to prove. Uh, I got a client that I work with in, in, here in Florida, and he owns a concrete company, and he says, I got primes that hire me all the time and pay me, and it won't even let me on the job site. No I could see that. Uh, yeah. Now now going and seeing it all, I could see exactly why they would do that. I could see exactly why. Well, the federal purchasing agents are in the same position. They have to hire 23%. So some of these guys are giving people contracts just because they're a small business. And the, the federal primes are doing the same thing. They have to hire small businesses, so they'll buy from you just because they can write it off. 
And that's why when I was talking earlier about those micro purchases that used to be, uh, you didn't have to be registered for micro purchases, but now that they're trying to show the 23% small business, a lot of these agencies are forcing these smaller contractors that normally do micro purchases, they're forcing them to register as well. For example, I got a client in California, she owns a restaurant, she makes breakfast and lunch. She's been selling to the government. She's got people that have been coming to her restaurant for 20 years because there's a lot of federal offices in her in the shopping center where she her restaurant is. And she said some of these guys have been coming there so long, they're like her kids, you know. Well, uh, wow. a couple of years ago, they said, Miss May, we can't eat here anymore unless you register in this system because they're trying to show that there's <laughs> any money with money. And they're talking lunch and breakfast, you know, 10, 20, maybe a couple hundred dollars a day that they're claiming because they're trying to show every dime they're spending is going to small businesses. And I know you guys hear me say this till I'm blue in the face. Uh, stop overthinking this stuff because it, it, the, the proof is in the pudding right here. It's very simple. There's only 337,000 active for-profit businesses in SAM right now. Out of the 1.2 million that are in there, 900,000 of them are inactive. There's only 337,000 for-profit that are active. Mm. Out of those, more than half of those are big business. But if you just think half are big, half are small for argument's sake, that's only about 160,000 small businesses that are active in the system. Compared to 30 million small businesses that are registered in the U.S., that's a drop in the bucket. Compared to the competition you have outside of the federal arena, you've got 30 million people you're, you're working, fighting with in the, in the non-federal arena. and the federal arena, it's only about 160. And out of that, we've done 80,000 SAM registrations, so I can only guarantee that half of those people are active and compliant. They might be active, that doesn't mean they're compliant. So if you figure, right. if you figure that half of them aren't compliant, you're talking 80,000 people competing over 23% of the entire federal budget which is a mind-boggling number. And that's why you'll see situations where that guy that I showed you, one of our clients, went from <clears throat> doing a million business and the government gave him a billion-dollar contract with a B because they're trying to meet their set-aside. And they can do it right. with just one, one award, you know, or they'll do it with a bunch of micro-purchases or they'll do it with as many purchases as they can. And they'll force people to register that didn't normally need to register just to show that they're hiring small businesses. So, so yeah. when I respond to some of these emails to some of these cards, do I just say I'm interested in prime or, or sub subcontracting with you guys, or just how do I how do I label it? I mean, because it's an unknown area. Whether they want to subcontract, want me to be a sub owner or the prime or whatever, how do I label the email? You just ask them that golden question: What can I do to earn your business? That SBLO knows what they need to do to hire you to write it off. Whether they hire you as a sub or they buy from you directly, they can still post that in the ESRS. Okay. You ever Makes heard, a lot of sense. You ever heard my story about the uh, construction guy that didn't know uh, he could hire people and write it off in the ESRS? He thought he had to have subs actually physically come out and work on the contract? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, he's he he was you know he wanted to get on a GSA and he was telling me about this new building he just built and and how much he hated the ESRS. And uh, and I said, well, that building that you just built, you got a janitorial company cleaning it, right? Well, of course I do. Are they federally registered? Are they a federal vendor? And he's like, well, I don't know. Why does that matter? Because if they're federally registered, you can claim what you pay them in the ESRS, and that's one less contractor you have to hire to physically work on the contracts. Because he hated hiring subs right. when he has to babysit them and redo their work when they don't do it his way. Um, he didn't realize that every dime he spends, if he spends it with a federally registered vendor, he can write it off in the ESRS regardless of what the work or the product was. You know, I said, you buy cigars and, and I said, you drink scars, beer, liquor? Yeah. Buy it from a federally registered vendor. Write it off. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Everything he buys now. He even told me, he told his accountant, if you don't get registered, I'm going to fire you and hire a new accountant. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, he referred everybody to me to get registered. So, fantastic. Any other questions? Now, if there's no other questions, I want to show you guys something I've realized today. Go ahead. I put out videos, which you guys well know. 
and I try and get as many views on my videos and I try and get more subscribers on my videos and, and <clears throat> I'm up to 719 subscribers. Uh, my main training video is uh, I think 18,000 views now. Where are we at? We go to newest, go to most viewed. I 18,209 views. So I'm always trying to figure out ways to get more views on my videos or, or get more videos posted faster. Uh, I used to write articles in LinkedIn all the time because in LinkedIn, I've got like 16,000 followers in LinkedIn now. Um, and what I used to do is I used to go to my profile and I got 15,784 followers. I used to go to my profile. I would write an article. And it takes a half an hour because I have to download pictures for it. Then I have to create the article and then upload the pictures into the article and then upload the data and the, the verbiage into the article and then modify it a little bit because it doesn't always work properly. And then add in my links and put in my hashtags and put in my contact information and, and make sure everything's lined up properly and do the rest of the editing and then add a few more pictures and then tie it all up and clean it and then upload it. And all that stuff takes time. And then I'd get you know, 10, 15, 20 views uh, on, on most of my articles, and that's it. I wouldn't get a whole lot of views. Some of them would get two or 300 views. Some of them, like this one, got 37, but that one only got eight. Uh, I learned that I started using what's called clickbait. I started using pictures that people just can't resist clicking on just because of the picture. And started Wait a second, it. wait a second. You got a picture of the Wolf of Wall Street. You need to ex explain that, that picture in there. <laughs> this is... Um, <laughs> This is one that came about because I saw another guy's article that was 10 things that will never change in sales. And uh, the guy has the same number of followers that I do in LinkedIn, but his articles get 5,000 views and 100 comments. And I'm like, what is he doing that I'm not doing? And one of the pictures he used was DiCaprio. So I figured I reposted his article, changed the picture, uh, made sure I noted in the article that it was his article. And uh, sure enough, I got 90 clicks versus using regular clickbait and only getting 30 or 40. But I learned something else today that was even more important, and I figured it out on accident. It takes so long to write these. It is a lot of time invested. But I realized if I go, instead of posting it on my profile, if I just go to LinkedIn Home and post an article here on LinkedIn's homepage, and not spend all that time adding hashtags and contact information and all that other stuff. Watch this. I posted this one today, okay? Four hundred and ninety five views in one day. Wow, that's pretty cool. Huge. Compared to ten, fifteen views in a day. And wow. I still put the video so they can click on the video and go watch it. So that gets me more uh, YouTube views. I just figured this out today. You know, I get people like, dude, you're a social media guru. You know everything. I don't, guys. I'm figuring a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. out as we go. And, and they change it about every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They just changed uh, LinkedIn a couple of months ago, and I hated it because it was different. And I didn't want to learn something new. I just got used to the old system. Um, I posted this one yesterday. And lo and behold, I used some clickbait, something to make people click on it. 500 views in one day. That's crazy. That's amazing. Crazy. That is amazing. So I'm, I'm not going to post many more articles on my actual LinkedIn. I'm going to start posting them on LinkedIn's homepage and taking advantage of that and then adding the link to my YouTube video to drive them back to YouTube as well. And if you guys want to get videos up on YouTube or you want to do a LinkedIn or do social media marketing, let me know. I'll teach you everything I know. Hmm. The reason why no, these videos okay. the reason why these videos get so much view time, uh, the reason why they, they go number one, you know, if you search government contracts, this one comes up number one out of a couple of hundred thousand videos. But this is the reason why. Where's the analytics? Um, this is Queen. My serial number is six. So 
So out of 760,000 results, mine's number one. And here's why. That's great. Look at the analytics. If you have a video on YouTube that's viewed more than two minutes, that's really good. A two-minute duration, a two-minute view time is, is very good view time on YouTube. My, my main video's view duration is 13 minutes. That's insane. Very few people have that kind of view time on their videos. And that's why my videos come up number one. It's because of the, the relevance. I, I like to say relevance because I'm a rebel. <laughs> so if you guys want to learn how to do this stuff, I'll teach you anything I know. Anything that will make you more successful, I'm here for you. All right? You know, John, I was going to share with you uh, and share with everyone else. I, I ran across a situation where I was filling out a um, proposal, and I got several different quotes from companies to do some machinery and uh, the, the lease on some – the uh, uh, rental on some machinery. And I think one of the uh, the guys there – and you might reflect in on the – you might chime in on this, but I think one of the guys at one of the places – intentionally bid it differently and he, he knew that I haven't had didn't have that much experience but he bid it under but the figures came out right but he still bid it under and I looked at it as a trap and because if the if the transaction would have gone through and they would have gotten their machine their 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 machinery back the usage would have been a lot more and I'd have been charged for the overage not the not the military so have you have you seen people like sabotaging deals I mean because it almost seems like he was sabotaging my deal for somebody else's yeah yep yep when uh, when it comes to brokering you know it's it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world you're gonna run into people that are gonna be try and betray you and steal from you and get you put out of business if they can shut you down that's one less competitor they have now they can charge more you know yeah um, it's like when, when people, uh, I mentioned TV guy and, and other people that I've taught to broker that win contracts and people will call them and say, Hey man, will you help me? They're not going to help you. You're going to compete against them. You know, right. Uh, they might act like you're helping you, but they're sabotaging you. They're stabbing you in the back when it comes to getting, well, this parties. was, this was a, a, this was a large company that could not bid on it, but I think the guy knew somebody that was going to bid on it. They already have a distribution he, network. If they're a large company and they've been doing government contracts and they can't bid on it now, he's got somebody that he sells it to and they give him a kickback. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yep. Um, if you look at Herb with uh, Pyramid, he won that contract for Petroleum. The company he subbed it out to is the company that's held the contract for the last 10 years. But they yeah. couldn't bid on it this year because it was a small business set aside, and they didn't have that network set up yet. So he just happened to be the right man at the right time in the right place. And because they held the yeah. contract before and they knew what they charged last year, they gave him a really good price so they would still get the work and he could still make money on it. Oh, dang. Yep. Well, they did. Uh, both companies did approve my account, so I have an account with both companies. But you know, I'm just going to find next time when they have another deal come out, I'll use my account number and bid on it, and um, uh, and then I'll just tell them it's a. I won't even tell them what it's for. And in the last uh, the last couple of days, then I'll tell them that it's for a government deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do that. And you know, when it comes to quantities too, uh, never give them an exact quantity because that allows them to put exactly. two together. There was a contract That's one exactly. of our clients was working on where the quantity was 887, and I said, ask them for a quote for 875 or 850. Don't give them the exact right. amount. So if it, if it's too specific of a quantity. And they're going to be like 887. I know where that's going. That's going to the government. I mean, how many orders a day do they get that's 887 quantity? Yeah, um, or, or even that large of a quantity. So, yeah, but never overestimate. Never, if they want 850, don't ask them for a quote on 900 because then they can come back and say, well, you're ordering less quantity, so I'm going to have to charge you more. Yeah. Always underquote a little bit. All right. And that's All right. Cool. Well, I. That's that's also why I tell people to try and get three or four offers, try and get three or four quotes, so you know you're not getting uh, a bad quote from someone who's, who's trying to uh, shamboozle you. Well, the other thing I've noticed is that when you go on to do uh, to, to do a um, um, proposal, a lot of times it'll ask you, do you want to do another proposal? Does that mean like you can take the same solicitation and it might be from another distributor or something like that and then do another proposal on the same solicitation yeah that or sometimes they'll be asking they want to buy ten different things and you can only provide five of them 
So they'll ask you to provide them with a one proposal with, with five and the other proposal with all 10, but you know, you're going to have to charge them more for the other five things because you don't normally carry those. Or uh, I see. there's situations where they'll ask if you can send in multiple quotes, meaning if you have a better solution, you can give them a quote based on their solution, but then you can give them a second quote based on your solution, which might be better or cheaper. I see. So they do listen to, to rhyme or reason on a lot of these solicitations if, if whoever's keying them in may not know the exact, uh, you know, exact thing that needs to happen here because I noticed, you know, one of the, the deals there was like the contractor called, the, 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 the supplier told me, look, they're going to need ramps because some of these cables are real big and if there's any traffic there, you're going to need these ramps and we'll throw them in for free. So I put in the solicitation, they're gonna th we're going to throw ramps in for free. And they love that. They, I mean, they love that. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. And keep in mind, too, a lot of purchasing agents are jack of all trades. They buy 10,000 different things a year. They don't know anything about none of them. And yeah. then you're going to yeah. run across some purchasing officers that are specialists. Um, when SAM was implemented back in 2012, it took several months for people to migrate over. Even when they hired us, it, it, you know, it took us a couple of weeks to get people migrated over because there was a new system. It had problems. I got a phone right. call from a purchasing agent one day, and she said, listen, I was told by one of my vendors that you can help these guys get registered. She said, I hope you can, because if you can't, veterans are going to die. And I'm like, well, you got my attention. What's going on? You know, she said, I buy blood and plasma. That's all she buys. She doesn't buy chairs mm -hmm. and, and needles and anything else. She buys blood and plasma for several different VAs. That's it. That's her specialty. So she knows every single thing about blood and plasma there is to know. The problem was her vendors couldn't get migrated over, and she hasn't been able to pay them for the last two months. And her vendors are telling her, look, if you can't pay us, we're not supplying you anymore. And she said, we've done every blood drive we can. No one else here can give blood. We can't legally take more blood from these people because they're going to get sick. She said, if I can't get these vendors registered and registered soon so I can pay them, we're going to run out of blood, and veterans are going to die. And uh, that was one of the very few purchasing agents I've ever met who really specialized in one thing. Most of them are jack of all trades. They buy so many different things a year, they don't know much about any of them. So they make mistakes all the time. And they respect your opinion because you're a specialist in the field. You know what you're talking about. They don't. Hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Hey, John, I just had a question. Um, it's not to you. It was it's really to the gentleman who earlier said he had won, just recently won a contract. Yes. I was just wondering how long has he been, was this his first one, or how long has he been doing it? Because I take those as motivations for, for me. He got I don't signed know if he's up. still on the call or not. Uh, yeah, I'm still on here. Uh, I was about okay. three weeks into it. The, fir the first week was pretty much just getting things set up in Sam and all that good stuff, and the, and then uh, once I had, let's see, what was it? Oh, I was waiting on a Duns number two, so couldn't do a whole lot, but I went ahead and did on a bunch of stuff, probably, I don't know, one bid a day or something like that, just on small, small stuff. Um, okay. And then probably in that time, probably in a three-week time frame, I had submitted like 30 bids total on a bunch of small okay. ones. And okay. So, yeah, about took about three weeks or so for me. So he literally, first one. Okay. literally signed up with us about a month ago, and he's already won his first about contract. About a month ago. And that's not, that's not okay. that uh, strange of a thing. I get people that win their first bid all the time. And the beauty of it is this. He submitted 30 bids. He's still got probably 20 of them out there that haven't been awarded yet. Wow. It's yeah, not like exactly. he submitted 30 wow. and won. He submitted 30 and so far has won one. You too, brother. Have a good weekend. Yep. That's why I tell you guys, submit yeah. as many bids as possible, make as many phone calls as possible. If you throw enough stuff at the wall, some of it's going to stick. Did you write, sir, did you write your own bids, you yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I prepared every single one of them myself. I had a lot of help and, and, from, and, from and, John and, and just on general questions, but okay. as far as each individual bid, I did myself. He's, did you he's, did he's you have to use any stuff? Training almost every day and listens and asks questions and and okay. takes advantage of me. That's why I make myself available every day yeah. from four to five, so you guys have access to me to get you up to par as quickly as possible. 
Okay. Did I'm, you have to use any subs? Uh, yes. Uh huh. Most, okay. Most of okay, them are wow. using subs because we're pretty limited on what we can do in house. Okay. Wow. Well, well congratulations. You bought a, uh, It's a great way to end a Friday. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. Yeah. It and Mash, just just for your first name, mine's Trent. Just so I know when I hear Darren. you on on the calls. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's Darren. Darren. Okay. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. I'm Trent. Yeah. No problem. Uh, hey, John. Thanks for letting me do that. You got it, man. Any other questions? It's Friday. It's 5 o'clock. I say we get the heck out of here. That sounds good. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. No problem. Any Take time. care, John. Off, sign off like John Wayne for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing, Pilgrim. <laughs> have a good weekend, John. You guys have a great Thank week. you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, yeah, bye.